أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين إمامنا وسيدنا الحجة ابن الحسن المهدي المنتظر أرواح العالمين له الفدا قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما وليكم الله ورسوله والذين آمنوا الذين يقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة وهم راكعون صدق الله العلي العظيم in this holy verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that Allah is indeed your guardian. And so is the Prophet, peace be upon him, your guardian. And those who believe, then the Quran describes them. Who are those who believe? Those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who establish their prayers and who give charity even while they are in prayer, bowing, وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ In the state of ruku' According to the commentators of the Holy Qur'an, and according to history, this verse was revealed in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi alayhi. As this verse describes him, when a poor man came to him, while he was praying, and he asked him to give him some help, to give him some money, the Imam extended his hand and he was wearing a ring and he gave him that ring in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Throughout history, great individuals leave an impact on their societies and on their communities and on the world at large. The average human being is more affected by his or her society than affecting his or her society. Usually, you see that if the society is a corrupt one, it's a socially corrupt one, then the average human being will be affected by his or her environment. The society leaves the greater impact on a human being. However, great individuals in history, and we find them in every single age and time, those individuals are not so much affected by their societies, but they affect their societies. And they leave a great impact on those whom they lived with and on the world at large. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He has given us 12 rightly guided Imams. The first of them is Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. This great man, the successor of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, whom the Prophet explicitly, as the Quran states, appointed him as his successor on the day of Ghadir Khum, in which hundreds of thousands of the companions of the Prophet had gathered so that he would make that divine announcement. It is from the mercy of Allah that Allah has given us such leaders as the Prophet and the Imam. Salamullahi alayhim. It is a great mercy that Allah has given us a human being like us to follow. Allah did not ask us to follow the angels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us to follow a human being whom we can relate to and connect to and learn from. Now great individuals in history also have two aspects to themselves. They attract and they repel. They attract because of their goodness, because of their sincerity. When people come to realize how pure their hearts are, how dedicated to Allah they are, naturally they are attracted to them. But at the same time, many people are also repelled by such individuals. They develop this hatred, this odium, this contempt for these great individuals. If we are to look at the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, we see that over a billion people on this world, Muslims and non-Muslims, are attracted to his personality. 
This is because you represented the peak of goodness. But at the same time, you have people who accuse him, who slander him. This is common. We see figures who unfortunately assume a very high status, such as the Pope, making such derogatory remarks on the greatest individual Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ever created. This is because the Prophet has two aspects to him. He repels and he attracts. Now why does he repel? Why does a great individual repel? A great individual repels because most people dislike the truth. People hate the truth. The Quran is very clear on this. The Quran says, Most people hate the truth. We claim we love the truth. But when it comes to us, when we are being tested, we dislike the truth. Amir al-Mu'mineen is a prime example. Millions of people are attracted to him, to him because of his belief, because of his great status. But on the other hand, millions of people also have this contempt for him because of his greatness, because he was always with the truth. According to all Muslims across the board, they narrate that the Prophet says, Ali mahal haq, wal ma Ali. Truth is always with Ali, and Ali is always with the truth. It is therefore no surprise that you have across history many groups who would even kill those who love Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. I'm in Iraq, in many places in Iraq, till this very day, in this very moment, they stop people who are traveling from one point to another. If they discover that his name is Ali Hassan Hussein, if he's a Shia, if he loves Imam Ali, they immediately behead him and kill him. This is because of the greatness of Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib Now tonight we have gathered here in order to commemorate the great tragedy that occurred with this great Imam. On such a night, our respected Imam was hit in the masjid by one of the greatest enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us briefly discuss some aspects of this great individual and what contributions he gave to society, to humanity at large. Tonight I'll just focus on two aspects of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. The first is the service that he gave to his people and the second is his divine knowledge that he had from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we look at the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, we find that amongst the greatest actions is to serve your brother and sister in faith, in humanity, in creation. He himself, Imam Ali, says that people fall into two categories. Either they're your brothers in faith, meaning they, they share the same religion as you do, or they're your counterparts in creation. We're all the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, we have a mutual relationship with each other, that we have to respect one another. One of the greatest acts is to help the people. One hadith states, الخلق عيال الله The creation is the family of Allah, because it is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the symbolic family of God. Then the hadith says, أحبكم إلى الله أنفعكم لعياله The most beloved of you to Allah is the one who benefits his creation the most, who helps his creation the most. It is one of the greatest virtues because it represents the peak of humanity. When you help someone, you are representing the humanity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled and created in you, that innate nature that you have. This is why it's so beautiful. You don't ask for anything. Time is precious. In our societies, we understand how precious time is. You are willing to give that time and not ask for anything in return to help your brother and sister in faith. This act has a great value with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a great reward those who give from their precious time to the people. Now Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam represents the one who was so humble, who displayed so much humility to serve those who needed his assistance. It has been narrated that one day, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, in the midst of the heat, he was walking in the streets of Kufa. 
his capital. He sees a woman, an elderly woman, carrying a very heavy bucket of water on her shoulder. And it seems that she could not bear it anymore. It was too heavy for her, and there was no one to help her. So the Imam, he approaches her, and he asks her if she wants any assistance. She said, yes, I want assistance, please. But let me tell you, oh man. Now she did not know this is Imam Ali. Remember, Imam Ali was the Khalifa at that time, the ruler. But there were no TVs or pictures. And the people, most of them, did not know how he looked like. They knew that he was the Khalifa, but they had never seen him. So he approaches her without her knowing who he is. He offers to assist her. She tells him, yes, I need your assistance. But know that may God never forget Ali, forgive Ali. He says, why? She says, because my husband went to war with him and he was killed in the battlefield and no one is looking after us. The Imam is deeply troubled over you. What would an average ruler do? He would probably take her to court. If not kill her, he'd punish her or rebuke her. But look at this man. The Imam nodded his head down. In shame, what is he going to do? It's true. Her husband was killed in one of, one of the wars. It was some defensive war. The Imam was being attacked. Now the Imam goes home. The following day, he brings her a huge bucket full of food, meat, and everything that she needed. He knocks at the door. She opens the door. She says, who's at the door? He says, I'm the same person who helped you yesterday. She says, please, I thank you so much for your assistance. The Imam goes inside. He sees that she had many small orphans in her house. So the Imam tells her that either you allow me to cook the food, or if you want, I'll take care of the children and feed them while you make the food. She says, no, cooking is my job. It's the woman's job. So you take care of the children. So the Imam, he sits busy with the children. Imagine, the Imam was a ruler of more than 50 countries. If you look, at the Islamic government at that time, it spread so far east to include Africa and Spain and all the way to China and India. The Islamic state was huge. And the ruler of the Islamic state is so humble to sit with a widowed woman and a few orphan children to help them. The Imam is sitting with her children. He is trying to help them, trying to attend them till attend to them till the mother makes the food. Then the Imam looks at the children and he says, Oh children, please pray for Ali ibn Abi Talib, for he needs your prayer. Then the woman wanted to light the fire in the oven, so she told Imam Ali, please can you light the fire for me? The Imam goes up to light the fire. When he lights the fire, the flame comes towards Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and he feels the heat. When he feels the heat, he says, Oh Ali, taste the heat of this small fire, but don't taste the heat of the fire of the hereafter. You look at the sincerity and the belief that this great man had. Then as she was cooking the food and the Imam was playing with her children, suddenly her neighbor walks in. She looks, she sees the Khalifa, the ruler in her house, playing with her children and helping her make the food. She tells him, why Haki, do you know who this man is? She says, no, this is a man who offered his assistance and I took it. She says, this is the successor, this is the Khalifa Ali ibn Abi Talib As she, When she heard that, she was completely shocked. What could she say? What could she do? She fell to the ground, apologizing for Imam Ali. She said, I am so sorry, I did not know that you were the Khalifa. He says, no, please, I have to seek your apology because your husband died in one of the battles and we forgot about you. From that day, the Imam continued assisting her. Yes, my respected brothers and sisters, this was the Imam. This was his nature. This was part of his actions every single day. In the middle of the heat, and for those of you who've been to Iraq, in the midst of the summer, the heat is blazing. It's very, very hot. The Imam would go in the afternoon and his companions would see that he's walking in the streets. They would tell him, what are you doing, oh Imam? In this hour of the day, in this heat, the Imam is saying, I'm looking for someone who needs my assistance. The Imam did not wait so that the people come to him 
to see their assistance, but he would go to the people and to see if they require any assistance. Sometimes for those who have dignity, it's difficult for them to come and ask you. You have to go to them. This is a lesson that our Imam teaches us. He used to go to the bazaar, to the market every day. For those who needed a direction, who were lost, he would guide them. For those who needed a lift, he would give them a lift. For those who were conducting business transactions, the Imam would advise them to respect one another and to observe the rights of each other so that their income would be lawful. So the Imam represents the peak of serving humanity and the peak of serving his brothers and sisters in faith. This is one aspect of our respected Imam. Another aspect is the knowledge that the Imam possessed. That divine knowledge. He was connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one tradition he says, the Prophet in one hour taught me a thousand sciences, a thousand doors of knowledge, a thousand gates of knowledge were opened to me. In each gate there are a thousand doors. This is the knowledge that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, received and learned from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. The Imam made a great contribution to society. Knowledge means advancement. Through knowledge a human being advances. Those who are knowledgeable understand who Allah is. Knowledge is even power. In our age, information is power. The more information a government, a group, a company possesses, the more advanced they are, the more power they have. The more information the FBI collects about you, the more powerful they become in your society. Knowledge is power, my respected brothers and sisters. Therefore, we are ordered to seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. As the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, has instructed us. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, contributed to all sciences, to sociology, to psychology, to history, to every science that's possible, to even physics and mathematics. The Imam would solve the most difficult math problems that there were during his time. Very difficult math problems. But one of the great sciences that the Imam contributed to is the science of the earth, of geology, and the universe itself, our solar system. You have to remember that for thousands and thousands of years, people thought that the earth was flat, that the sun revolves around the earth, that the earth is at the center of the universe. Great thinkers, philosophers, they believed in this. They thought that the earth was at the center of the universe. It wasn't until the 16th century that Copernicus gave this theory and he established it. And he said that no, the sun revolves around the earth. Using some astronomical ways, he proved that. So this was not proven until four or five hundred years ago. You see Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib in Nahj al-Balagha, he establishes this fact over 1400 centuries. I'll recite to you one piece of Nahj al-Balagha in which the Imam gives us his knowledge. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, in explaining the knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Man arada an yanzura ila Adam fi ilmih, fal yanzur ila Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. If you want to look at Adam, at his knowledge, then look at Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. The Quran says, with respect to the knowledge that Allah gave to Adam, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And Allah taught Adam everything there is to know. He was extremely knowledgeable. And the Imam, he possesses that knowledge as well. The Imam in Nahj al balagha he expresses this theory where he says, in speaking about the creation of the earth, the Imam says, فَسَكَنَتْ عَلَىٰ حَرَكَتِهَا مِنْ أَنْ تَمِيدَ بِأَهْنَهَا he says the earth, after rotating around itself and moving, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused it to be stable, to have a constant moving pattern, so that everything on the earth would be stable, so that the people could live on it, so that the creation can live on it. This is in, in Nahj al-Balagha. 
the Imam here establishes that the earth moves. 14 centuries ago. At that time when the people thought the, the earth was flat, and when they thought that the earth was not moving, it was stable, it was fixed, but that the universe would revolve around it. The Imam established this fact. In another hadith, the Imam says, وَعَدَّلَ حَرَكَتَهَا بِالْرَاسِيَاتِ Then the Imam says, Allah fixed the rotation of the earth through the mountains. In modern, society, in modern science, we read that the tectonic plates, and the most important thing about these tectonic plates on the earth are the mountains, because they are the ones that fix the earth, and they allow, they allow the ground to be stable. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib established this, 14 centuries ago. This is with respect to his knowledge and science. The Imam also taught us many important lessons. With regards to raising our children, the Imam has a very beautiful hadith. That if the parents keep this in mind, they can understand the experience of their children, the position of their children, and they can raise them better. The Imam says, لا تقصروا أولادكم على عاداتكم فأنهم مخلوقون لغير زمانكم. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, don't force your children to embrace the exact same customs and traditions that you have. Because they have been created for another time. <laughs> Teach them the values and principles of Islam. But with respect to the customs, don't force them. Your time differs than their time. Their generation differs than your generation, from your generation. So don't force them to embrace something that their generation does not accept. Yes, within the right limits, within the right framework of Islam, if they are following the main principles, then allow them to do so. Don't force them on these customs that you may have had and received from your forefathers. Yes, if it's something good, advise them, but don't force them. This rule is a golden key, my respected brothers and sisters. If we practice it in our societies, we can come to understand what our children are going through. And then finally, I'll conclude with this aspect of the knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib the contributions he made to the world of economics. We know that economy is a driving force in our society. When the economy is impacted, everything else in society will be impacted. Every human being strives to create an economic status such that he or she would be comfortable. To experience economic comfort is a goal that human beings have been trying to achieve for thousands and thousands of years. Now, for many years, for centuries, <coughs> scientists and social scientists, economists, they used to think that there were poor people in the world because of the low supply we have. If you would ask them, why is there poverty in this world? They will tell you, well, there's high demand and low supply. We don't have as many natural resources as we, as we would like to have. And there's high demand, therefore, you will have many poor people in the world. For many years, this was the common idea, the common belief, the common theory. It wasn't until this past century that the scientists discovered, no, that's not our problem. We have a lot of natural resources. We have a lot of supply in this world. That's not the problem. The problem of poverty is the lack of proper distribution. We have the natural resources. The money is there. The capabilities are there. But because of an unjust, unjust system in distributing this natural resource, then you have the poverty and you have the problem. Otherwise, every human being Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him or her the opportunity to live comfortably in this life. But when you have a certain group, a, cer a certain system dominating, they will look after their own rights and they will disregard the rights of other people. Ali ibn Abi Talib salam mentioned this again 14 centuries, ago, 14 centuries ago. Then one hadith he says, مَا جَاعَ فَقِيرٌ he says, whenever a poor man goes hungry, it's because a rich man has taken for himself, has procured too much wealth, and has not distributed it properly. 
The Imam establishes this fact 14 centuries ago. The first thing, my respected brothers and sisters, that Imam Ali did when he became the successor, he eliminated poverty from his government. Imagine a government that exceeds more than 50 countries of today. There is no poverty. A man would not go hungry at night. The Imam, this is the first achievement he made. In Nahj al the Imam expresses this. He says, The Imam says, maybe somewhere in my country, and this is an Arabic expression to show that there isn't anyone. Maybe there was someone in my territory who does not have a loaf of bread. The Imam made the statement to show that he eliminated poverty because of his justice, because of the just system that he applied in his society. Therefore, there was not a single human being who would sleep at night with hunger. The Imam eliminated the poverty from the face of his territory. Even here in America, I remember that I heard from a great scholar. He said he saw a statistics from the Department of Agriculture or some sort of department here saying that 10 percent of Americans are experiencing severe poverty. 10 percent of Americans. And many of them go hungry at night. The richest and the greatest nation in the world, but they have not solved the issue of poverty. But Ali ibn Abi Talib with the minimum resources that he had at that time, he solved this issue. The Imam used to deal with justly. He did not care if someone was his brother, his son, his relative. He dealt with everyone in a just manner. One day his brother Aqil came to him. He was older brother. And he had a lot of debts. So he came to the Imam. And he told him, listen, I have a lot of debts. Why don't you help out your brother? I mean, the Muslim treasury is under your hands. You could easily pick millions of dollars out there and give them to me to relieve my debt. The Imam told him, how much is your debt? He gave him a high number. He told him, I'm sorry, Aqib, but I don't have that money to give you. He told him, what do you mean? The Muslim treasury is in your hands. And you don't have the money to give me? He said, exactly, the Muslim treasury, it's not my treasury. This belongs to the Muslims. How can I give it to you? If you want, from my income, and the amount, the income that he received was the same as everyone else in society. He used to give three dinars or three dinars to the people at the end of the month, and he used to give himself and his children that same exact amount. He told him, if you want, I'll speak to my children and myself at the end of the month. If we have some surplus from our very minimum salary, we'll give it to you. I'll, I'm willing to help you, but not from the Muslim treasury. Aqil keeps on begging him, please, Imam. It's just right over there, just give it to me. The Imam tells him, listen, I've got a better idea. If you want money, I've got a better idea for you. He told him, what's the idea? The Imam was overlooking the bazaar. They were at the roof of a place. The Imam says, you see the bazaar down there? He said, yes, I see it. He says, do you see that huge lock or that place where they keep very important financials in there? He says, yes, I see it. I see that box. The Imam says, go to that safe box and break it and steal the money. He told him, who does that money belong to? He says, the people, the merchants over here, they keep it there so that at the end of the month, they come and they take it. He looked at Imam Ali, he says, are you kidding? Are you telling me to go and steal from these people? He told him, subhanAllah, you are forcing me to steal from all the Muslims. But if I tell you to steal from a few merchants, you don't accept it. Then it hit him. Aqil understood that this money belonged to the Muslims and the Imam couldn't. In another event, Aqil was insisting the Imam to give him some money. Aqil was blind. So the Imam went, he got an iron rod, a piece of metal. He put it on fire till it became red. And he came towards Aqil. Then the Imam says, come here, I have given you what you want. Aqil comes closer. The Imam brings the metal rod close to him. Suddenly he feels the heat of it. He tells him, Ali, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to kill me, burn me? He told him, SubhanAllah, you want to burn me in the hell of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that huge hell, and you're afraid of this little onion? 
Then he told him, Aqil, I have to deal with justice with people. So don't ask me to do something that I must not do. This treasury belongs to the Muslims. I'll help you from my own pocket, but not from the Muslim treasury. This was the justice of Ali ibn Abi Talib, my respected brothers and sisters. On such a night, we come to commemorate the tragic event that took place with Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib During the Prophet's lifetime, one day Imam Ali became very sick. He was very ill. The Prophet and his companions went to visit him. When they were visiting him, Anas ibn Malik reports this. He says that, I saw that Imam Ali was not feeling well at all. In fact, I even feared he might die in that illness. So we told the Prophet that this illness does not look good. And is there a chance that maybe he would die? Then the Prophet gave the answer. He says, no. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib will not die now. He says, لا بأس عليه. However, the Prophet says, وَإِنَّهُ لَنْ يَمُوتَ إِلَّا مَقْتُولًا مَضْرُوبًا عَلَىٰ أُمِّ رَأْسِهِ No, he will not die now. But yes, one day will come in which he will die. He will be struck on his head with the sword. He will be killed. مَضْرُوبًا عَلَىٰ أُمِّ رَأْسِهِ the blood will gush out from his head and his beard will be stained by his blood in the month of Ramadan someone will strike him while he was in prayer then the Prophet cried so much for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Anas ibn Malik one of the companions of the Prophet narrates this when the Prophet remembers the tragedy of Amir al muminin the Prophet cries, We tell you, O oh Prophet, O oh Rasulullah, where were you on that day, 30 years after you passed away, when Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was struck in the masjid? When Jibreel called in the sky that the pillars of faith have been destructed, they have been obliterated. History reveals that when Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib was hit by the sword, he asked his companions, he asked his two sons, Imam al Hassan and Hussein, to carry him to go home because the Imam could no longer move. So, Imam al Hassan and Hussein, they are carrying the Imam. And then, as they approach the house of Amir al Mu'minin, the Imam says, Oh, my two sons, please allow me to walk with you. No longer carry me. They tell him, Oh, Father, but why? Why do you think my respected brothers and sisters, Imam Ali does not want to be carried once he reached his home? They tell him, oh father, why? But you don't have energy, you've been struck, your, your head is gushing with blood. Why should we not carry you? He says, oh, because I fear that my daughter Zainab will see me in this state and I don't want to break her heart. Again, we tell you, oh Ali ibn Abi Talib, where were you on the day of Ashura in the land of Karbala to see the tragedies that occurred with your daughter Zainab alayhi salam and your son Imam al Hussein? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا آلَ مُحَمَّدٍ أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ